then since uh, March, I think it is, and it is about, I think it's like. And uh, in the group, uh, we want to express our thanks to Aaron over there, who is the Minister of Music and other things at his church, and he's, of course, the son of Bob and Judy. We want to thank him for his piano playing, and he'll be singing and having all sorts of uh, participation later. And let's see what else we have here. The, uh, we're having a rummage sale in September, so if you have items, you don't have to do that. <laughs> of course, I guess it's about time when you get paid back for something that you have to do. And then we do, this is, like I said, a special occasion. And there will be a Bible study for men and women starting this Friday. And if you take the house, if you look in the bulletin, you can get all the details on that. And anybody recognize that picture that's on the screen? That's the original building where South Avenue Baptist Church first started meeting here in South Avenue. And we'll be having the 50th celebration and two people that were instrumental in doing that are here today to participate with us. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me, but one is from uh, Larry from uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Johnson. Huh? Johnson. Larry Johnson. And then the, um, there's a guy from Converge who used to be uh, yeah, anyway, Columbia Baptist Church. I'll cover those announced. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, they're here to also participate in the festivities today, and hopefully they'll be here on October 10th. At 2 o'clock here in this auditorium, we'll be having a celebration. And then after that, there will be desserts and all that sort of good stuff downstairs. Now, we have a little favor to ask. It's been a long time since we've had a group picture. And usually, when we do group pictures, we try to meet outside on the steps. But since the weather is kind of, well, it's, I think it's sunny now, but who knows what we'll be doing after the church. <coughs> We'd like those on the outside pews to move in to come the center so we can push the area is going to be for come on, move in. This will, be, this, will be, this will be temporary. You can go back to your your zone of comfort uh, later, right after the picture. But if you could be included in we're having you remain seated so we can see a little few more faces. And this will just be a very momentary photo ah, we'll, we'll take it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to 
be here this morning. We thank you that uh, we can come and worship you and sing praise to you and to give of our free will gifts to you. There's an appreciation of our appreciation for all you've done for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Yeah. 
ascended to heaven, and the church was born. And we read in chapter 2, the book of Acts, at verse 42 through verse 47, these words. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You may have seen it. Well, we're going to have a tag team sermon today. You could call it that. Because uh, our guest speakers will take one point in the outline of our church mission statement, which you can see in various places, including on the cover of the bulletin and up on the screen, we see there a description of the activities of the early Christian church, summarized in these three objectives with a goal that the world may know our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so these points of our church motto or our mission statement will be the points that are being addressed by our guest speakers today. And so I'm giving the introduction not only to what we're up to in this time of receiving from God's Word, uh, but I will also provide you with a little bio introduction to our guest speakers. And I want you to uh, recognize that in the passage uh, I just read to you, uh, or call to your attention concerning this passage, which I hardly gave you any time to look up if you wanted to. Zach, I'll just tell you where it is. I'm not preaching a, a message on this, but it, it's Acts chapter 2, the last five, six verses of the chapter. But there are some note, notes worthy for our attention. One of them is, in the spirit of our mission statement, that you may note that those believers who were all having all things together, sharing all things together, continued steadfastly in some various practices and activities. They continued with a devoted heart to the Lord, the one who had made all this possible and who had unleashed the Holy Spirit to bring power into the life of the church, a breath of fresh air, figuratively speaking. A reality of life and power, animation, activity that stirred the hearts of the people in such a way that they were gladly sharing among themselves all things and rejoicing and being glad of heart and sharing meals together and all that they did just like we will today after the service, right? We'll be having a potluck. That's sharing our breaking of bread together for our purposes today. I suppose if I wanted to make one point out of this key passage, it would be to notice who it was that was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. Verse 47 tells us that while the people were praising God and having favor with uh, all the people, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who's in charge of church growth? The Lord. Real godly church that we studied in Sunday school this morning called the church at Philadelphia was apparently a very small church in an earthquake prone city. And yet it is one of the two of the seven churches in the book of Revelation that are commended for their devotion, their faithfulness, and their perseverance. So the Lord added to that church as many as were being saved, and maybe there weren't a whole lot in that era of persecution and opposition. 
So we are not today just talking about, oh, how we got to get busy, and we better work hard and redouble our efforts, because we need to fill every pew in the church. We don't need to do that, and God doesn't need us to do that. He will do it if he sees fit. Through us being the kind of devoted followers, steadfast followers, that we will hear described in the activities of the early church. Uh, not the focus on the early church, but the scripture that reinforces these basic, simple uh, functions of the local church for all of the church of Jesus Christ from that day until the day he returns and we see him face to face. With that in mind and the understanding that uh, we are being called by our mission statement to be devoted to the Word of God, I want to welcome to our pulpit Dr. Truett Johnson. Truett, let me have a hand and bring you up here just to really make it happen. I'm so glad you can stand and you're with us. Thank you. I feel welcome to your pulpit and uh, welcome to mine. It's kind of a sh been a shared pulpit. You've had 15 years of service and uh, you don't need much of an introduction to this man who has served you faithfully for those years. Truett Johnson, Dr. Johnson, please. Thank you.
may be adequate in the Greek word is there, mature. We need to grow up in Christ when we become Christians for babies. We need to learn to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow so that we can share the message of Jesus Christ with the people of this world and they so desperately need it and they need the Savior. Equipped for every good work. The goal of the church is devoted to the word of God so that you may grow and then go out and train and share and disciple and evangelize. And the second point was ties to our brother Bob is in verse 4, chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 1, 2. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. What's the next three words? Preach the word. Preach the word. What's he supposed to do? Preach the word. What's he supposed to do? Preach the word. How does he do it? He's got to be in the word, studying, learning, preparing, getting ready to communicate to you the word of God so that you can take it and take it in and that you can grow and that you can mature and that you can go out and share. South Aberdeen Baptist Church, I know for at least the last 30 years has been devoted to the Word of God. And Lord willing, however long God has you here, it will continue to be devoted to the Word of God, to the Christ of the Word of God. To share it with all mankind until it comes. And all God's people say,
we will sing concerning the Word of God that's our foundation. And then we'll have Him come and take Frank Tyler's place. Speaking of the worship of Christ and the devotion to Him. Will you uh, join me in singing? people. 
In fact, the first three verbs in this song are directives to sing, but after that, there are many other ways also that are described that we can respond to God. In our acts of worship to God, we proclaim the goodness of the salvation that we have received. Notice that we are to declare His character and His works where? Among the nations, among all the peoples. This is a call not just to worship as we gather within the walls of this facility, but to let our response to God be something that translates into the public square. You'll notice that in verse 3, the psalmist uses a curious but important word, among, instead of to. This isn't an instruction to just tell people about the Lord, though in the Bible there are certainly many places that tell that. This is an instruction to worship God among people. This is because the audience of our worship is not people. The audience of our worship is the Lord. In verses 7 and 8, furthermore, we're called to ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Again, you'll notice our responsibility is to devote ourselves to Him, giving direct credit to Him for all He has done as an extension of who He is. And finally, in verse 10, once more, again, we are commanded to proclaim the kingship, the reign of God. Where? Among the nations. So easy for us to fall into the trap of separating what we do here from what we do out there. It's easy for us to, um, sometimes in this culture in America, to, to, be, to, to try and be polite in the sense of uh, keeping discussion about God confined to certain places. Well, we certainly should be polite. But if it's a part of who we are, if it's a part, if our response to God and our identity in Him is a part of who we are, we should share it outside these walls. On the other hand, it's sometimes tempting for us to maybe even uh, lightly or maybe not so lightly thump strangers with, uh, over the head with the Bible or to try and persuade in a place where there's no trust or to even call unbelievers to the standards that God calls believers to. As I read this psalm, it calls us to do something different. Our worship is for God alone. It's not a utilitarian effort for the benefit of others. It's directed to God and for His benefit. But secondly, it's not to be confined. We are not only to worship in His sanctuary. We are to worship among all people. So here's my charge to you, people of God here at South Aberdeen Baptist Church, and to you, Dad, uh, their pastor. As you sing to him here, but not only here, demonstrate the character of a changed life. As you credit God by meeting the needs of orphans and widows in this community, or when you are asked how you can walk through trials like cancer or unemployment or the loss of loved ones with joy in your hearts and a song on your lips, when you proclaim his compassion by serving those incarcerated in a state prison or those enslaved by addiction. And as you do all of these things, you are proclaiming his salvation among all the people. You are ascribing glory to him among the nations. So credit him with all that is good. Respond to him with faith and trust and obedience. And do so publicly among the people with abandon and with humility. Let your response to him be the witness that you have to those around you. Your response now to this will be to sing the hymn, How Great.
And until the day I moved here and became a regular part of this community, I met with them every Tuesday night. And you, uh, the encouragement that came from that you brothers, Pat and, and Hugh, such a significant impact on my life and gave me really hope for uh, being able to even preach naked, uh, to, to be free about the truth and let it flow a little more than when I agree it's fun. Uh, to let the truth flow freely and uh, the encouragement of you guys being together. You, uh, you know, usually when you do uh, resumes, you, you start with their, their doctoral degree, and everyone goes, whoa, and you've got one of those. But with this guy, I want to tell you what his hobbies are. Fishing, marksmanship, and firearms collector. If you want to talk guns, talk to you. But he's done a lot of different things, and I know in the bullet it says he's retired, but he's really not retired, and he works with the uh, Ministry of Evangelism training with Evantel, and has pastored churches in Washington and in Texas, and worked for Bell Helicopter, and he's U.S. Army helicopter mechanic, crew chief, were, I guess he's not doing that anymore, but you know how to fly a Huey, don't you? You know, okay. So, uh, Louisville Baptist University, you got a PhD. You, you, amazing. He loves people when he talks so much, you hardly know that he's a, one of these doctor guys. Hugh, would you speak to us about encouragement to one another? Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. I don't remember where I met Bob. I do remember the smile, though, that came with him the next time I saw him, so I assumed that he had it back then. The smile was encouraging to me. I don't remember that necessarily I planned on inviting him to a men's meeting and giving him a free battery charge or anything like that, but I'm glad to hear that happen. And that sort of sums up the whole idea of why we encourage one another. If you don't see a smile on a person's face, give him one of yours. It won't hurt you a bit at all. And you'll be surprised how that relates almost directly to our whole purpose for being believers and being left on this earth is that we are to tell the message of Christ, the gospel. And often the prelude for being able to do that is to find someone that doesn't understand they need it. And you begin by encouraging them. When I first became a believer, uh, it was in the aftermath of a tremendous problem and a lot of violence. I'm not going to go into detail. You think I was bragging about how brave I am or whatever like that, but that wasn't the case. It was how foolish that I was. And I uh, went to school that day. I was still in high school. And I was out of gas. I noticed that this tank is almost empty in my car. And I had 63 cents. Two quarters, a dime, and three pennies. And I pulled into a service station, and the owner came out. His name was Mr. Hinton. And I handed him the, the money, rather embarrassed. And he started pumping the gas. Well, back in that, that time, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but back in that time, uh, you could get quite a bit of gas for 63 cents. It was enough to get me home and back to school the next day. And in my troubled environment, that was about it. You know, if I could live to the next day, fine, I'm going to do it. Well, anyway, he said, is that all the money you have? And I said, yes, 
semester, and he said, I thought you had a job after school. And I said, I did, but I got fired. I didn't know how else to say it. I mean, you know, there's a place you just can't say anything else. And he said, uh, did you steal that money? And I said, no, sir, I did not steal it. And he said, well, tell me what happened. And I said, well, my friend stole it, and I knew it. And my friend owed me the money. It was quite a bit of money. I'm going to tell you how much, over $1,000, okay? And he said, what happened to the money? And I said, well, it was confiscated, and I don't have it anymore. And he says, you don't have a job either? And I said, no after school job at all. And he said, will you come to work here tomorrow and I'm gonna fill your tank up right now. Mr. Hinton was a believer and he always had a smile. He always had a sense of encouragement and his very existence was always encouraging to me. And he took me to Sunday school and they had a lesson from the book of Acts about how Paul and Mark had had a little bit of a problem. I've never fully understood that. Both grace men, and yet they were fussing about something. And the Bible says right there is something that if you never read anything else about encouragement, what it says there should do it. It says that Paul and Mark went their separate ways. What a tragedy in a way. It worked out in the end, but what caught my attention, and it's always there with me, is that they went their separate ways, but Barnabas took him. And I learned about Barnabas that morning, something that fits into your scheme of the whole idea of your church. You want to encourage one another. Barnabas took him. And the next time we hear about anything about Mark, Mark's got all the problem worked out. Why? Because in the program of what was happening, Barnabas, as a gracious man, took him. I'm glad to be here today, Bob, and I know that you encouraged me, and even I met you, and then it was six or eight months later, I met you again, I didn't remember your name, so you introduced me. And somebody did that here today to me. They came up and, and introduced themselves to again, because I had forgotten their name. And so that saves me an embarrassment. That's always encouraged to be one less embarrassment in this world. Give other people encouragement. We live in a sad world, a tragic world. And if you're the person who encourages someone, you may be the person who will learn from them in heaven that you are the reason they are there. Thank you. Stand, please, and sing the song, The Family of God and the Bond.
of the road, they will become very unhappy. And I'm thankful that God calls us out of ourselves to see beyond ourselves, beyond ourselves individually and as a church, to those around us outside of the church. And Reverend Steve Welling is going to be coming to speak to you as a brother that I am just getting to know, but as many very shared uh, number of associations with me, having visited with him in his office, about uh, some brothers and sisters in the Lord and ministers that we have known in common and could uh, easily understand. We both served in Northern California Baptist Conference at churches back in the 80s. Woo! A while back. And now Steve is the uh, District Executive Minister of Converge Northwest, a um, affiliation of 85, over 85 churches in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska, committed to the proclaiming of God's word and to the expanding of God's message to those in our region. He has served as a pastor in churches and as ministry leader uh, and leadership development for over 30 years. He's a graduate of Whitworth University and, how can I say, Spokane? No, <laughs> Spokane. That's if you're down south. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, Whitworth uh, University and a Bethel Theological Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, his wife Susie is with us here. And he and Susie have been married for nearly 40 years and have three adult children and four grandchildren. I'm looking forward to our associations with you, Steve, and I know you've got a heart to see the word expand just as uh, Conversion Northwest is committed to. So I welcome you because that's what we want to hear a word about right now. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I'm, I am so glad to be here. And Steve, where's my wife? A smiling face. Okay, I just want to I uh, have a, a scripture and a few words I'd like to share with you. I, you know, these installation services, uh, the job that I have is, is kind of an odd job. I just want to confess that I, I used to be a pastor and uh, knew kind of the rhythm of life and every Sunday I would get up and go and preach a new sermon. And in this job, I have been doing this about nine years, and what I found is that I, I kind of go from place to place, and it sort of worked out. I, I have to write a new sermon about once a year, and uh, I know it's a burden to write that sermon, but <laughs> to come and talk to you about uh, an installation service to to put it in perspective that the world would know. Let me read what, what Jesus said in the Upper Room Discourse, chapter 17, as he begins to pray for himself and, and talk about his hope for his church. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they may know. All these other messages, I, I just had this thought, I, you have to forgive me, I have this thought, it's, it's like a preaching contest, and you know, at the end we're all going to stand up and somebody's going to hold their hand over us and you're going to applaud, like, who won, you know, we did the best job, I'm, I'm so nervous now, I just, the great stories, great passion and history of this congregation, it's so great. Scholarship in a deep voice. Already I'm jealous of the voice of me. But my portion of this, that they may know, moves from this nice little uh, philosophical, um, good feeling uh, stuff that we see up there. 
there that were devoted to the Word, that were devoted to the worship of Christ, that were devoted to encouraging each other. And then it says that, that they may know who is they. It's them out there. That somehow that all this has to come together in a way that people outside of us see it as real. That's the challenge. All of a sudden we're shifting from, from philosophy to boots on the ground. And it's not our boots, it's their eyes. Oh my goodness. So normally I would give a charge to the church. I'm giving a charge to you and the pastor in this case. And so in order for the world to see and know him, they've got to see something in us. And the first thing I would encourage you with is that you would love your pastor. Congregations are known by the community. It's not necessarily because they've all walked in the door, but they've met you at the grocery store. They met you at the gas station. They've met you at the schools. They know you. And they probably know where you go to church. And your church has a reputation. Every church has a reputation. And the best thing, one of the best things that you can do to, to let the world know that Christ is alive is love your pastor. Now, how does that work? Well, there's a couple of different ways. I, I write these kinds of notes. Trust your pastor. Trust your pastor. He has your best interest in heart. He is following the Lord. I'd say support your pastor. These are things that just kind of make sense, don't they? <coughs> Let me bring it home just a little bit more. Be nice. Can I simplify that a little bit more? Be nice. It's really all bad. All, all you have to do. Uh, when, when you talk to him, uh, after the honeymoon is over, by the way, every church has a honeymoon with their pastor. Right, Pastor? <laughs> and, and it usually lasts about a year, though I've experienced one that lasted about six weeks. So, it, uh, you know, you've already lasted longer. You're such a nice guy. They love you. They love you. They really love you. And so that, that honeymoon period lasts like a year. And, you know, when the year is up, and, and you've heard the joke before, and uh, it just is all too familiar, I say, be nice. Love your pastor. Trust that he's accepting a call from God on his life to serve you. Pastor Bob didn't have to do this. He's called. He feels compelled by the Spirit of God to be here with you, to live out all these things that we're talking about today. So that's my charge to the church in the same context. All that applies to you. Love your church. So there's a second side to this. Kind of like the other side of the coin. Let the pastor do the work of a pastor. Pastors, anyone in ministry get called to do all kinds of things. But Dr. Timothy Laniak, professor seminary on the East Coast, he's done 30 years of research on shepherds in Middle Eastern cultures. And he's written some books on this. It's fascinating reading, but he said that shepherds in those cultures that the Bible talks about have three primary responsibilities. Provide, protect, and guide. And so by provide, he means care for the flock, teach the flock in our case. Protect means to have courage. When things go on in, in the culture, to have courage to speak into them. To take the tools that you have and pro protect the flock. And then let your pastor guide. Let him lead. Let him lead joyfully. My third charge to pastor of the congregation. I really challenge you with this. Become a great congregation. Now some congregations are big, but that doesn't mean that they're great. 
I, I've worked in churches that have, have served as pastor in churches of under 70 people and over 2,500 people. I've been on you know, both ends of the spectrum. Size is not what I'm talking about. To be a great congregation, I would say, pray boldly. Don't be afraid to ask God. Take those scriptures. Ask, seek, knock. Let it be open. Let Him answer. Let Him take your prayer and reveal Himself to you. Not only pray boldly, but I would say practice generosity. And not generosity, not just the giving, because not every congregation has various levels of capacity. But have a generosity of spirit. When you're in the community, that you would be known as a generous congregation, that's how the world will see. In fact, I would say engage with the culture joyfully. If we're really talking about that the world may know him, we have reached a stage in Christian life in America that's different than what most of us in this room have grown up with. And we've got to wake up to it. And we've got to be aware. If you ask most people in our culture, how how is, is Jesus known in the church? They would be confused because they don't view the church as, well, what they would say is, I don't know, I guess Jesus is angry. We have, as, as evangelicals, I think kind of lost our track a few years ago, somewhere along the line, in my lifetime at least, I've seen how we have gone from being joyful in Christ to being angry about change. And I would like to call you back to be a great congregation and engage with your community and your, cultural, uh, your culture joyfully. In other words, that we live out our faith, that we enjoy living in Christ, and people see it. That's what I'm saying, that, you know, mine's the hard part of the sermon. Here's, here's a quote that I picked up the other day from Rabbi Zacharias, a tremendous teacher, professor, apologist for the Christian faith. If you, if you know Rabbi, you know that. He asked this question, how do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? See, that's the difference of our culture. Most of us grew up in a modern era when rational thought won the day. And it doesn't work that way anymore. People only, they don't care what you think, they care what they see. So when we talk about how do we engage the culture, how do we let the world know Him, they've got to see Him in our eyes, in our hearts, in our love for one another. It has got to be fleshed out. It's an incarnated, incarnational ministry. So I say, congregation, pastor, in South Aberdeen, Oakland, this whole Grace Harbor area, let the world see and know Him when they see your joy. Let the joy of Jesus Christ flow through you with a love for His Word, a love of worship, and a love for each other. All, all just spouting out of this incredible love that you have from Him and for Him. God bless you. We're going to hear a wonderful song.
when I came in and I sat down and I saw all those pictures that uh, you had up there, brought back a lot of old memories. And, uh, you know, I remember the first, before I pray, I was talking a little bit, okay? Uh, before, uh, you know, uh, today, the first time I came to, uh, I want to say Manny, the first time I came to South Aberdeen, uh, I remember back in the 1950s, uh, early 50s, that uh, our church, the Manny Baptist, uh, uh, the congregation, uh, they had uh, a concern for our ministries at Lake Retreat. How many people have been to Lake Retreat in this congregation? Some of you have? Okay. And uh, when I was uh, a youngster in grade school, uh, I would go up to Lake Retreat each summer and work. And then uh, when I got to be a little bit older, um, when I was 13, I remember, uh, our congregation started sending uh, carloads up there. Uh, we had... Uh, been in our church that would go up, they'd go up in the springtime on, the, on Saturday. We'd leave at 5.30 in the morning and we'd leave a manual over in Oakwim and we'd head toward Lake Retreat. And our job was to, uh, you know, prepare the camp for um, summer kids and so forth as they would be up there. And we would build buildings, we'd tear buildings down. And I remember being 13. And um, they took, I had a friend, a good friend named Rick Stern, okay, and Rick and I uh, would go up there and uh, we'd go with the older guys, and uh, we used to sit in the back seat in the middle of the pump, that's where I always sat. And I remember the first time I walked in the door of this church, we came over at 5.30, and there was a guy that shook my hand, and uh, he was going to be sitting beside me, and then there was another guy. And, that one man was a man by the name of Max Bradle. Does anybody know the name Max Bradle? He was one of the men that helped start this congregation, okay? I see a couple of hands there. And then the other guy that was sitting beside me was Archie Bruno. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Okay. Uh, if you go out to Clark's, you can see his picture out there still, I think. He uh, uh, led a uh, number of people to the Lord of the Streets in Aberdeen, and then he would minister out at North River also. And uh, you know, uh, I remember way back uh, in the early 50s that Emmanuel started to um, launch out. Uh, you know, they had a desire to, to reach Grace Harbor, and I was talking to uh, some of the older deacons at the time, and, you know, we had a large uh, repair bill at Emmanuel uh, from the 1920s and the 30s, and we finally paid that off. And, uh, so we decided we would establish some churches if we could plant them, and that's where South Aberdeen came in, and then we planted another one uh, in Westport. And I can remember those pictures up there. Uh, I saw pictures of Larry and Audrey Ostrander. How many people know the Ostranders? A few of you? Okay, good. And uh, I remember when he came here uh, back in 1959, and uh, it was a very exciting time, and then uh, I think of, you know, people that I know in this area, probably the, the Ostranders more than anybody else. I think model Christianity in their family over the years. They've been tireless workers, even today, working for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, remember when Landon Derringer came. How many people know Landon? How many? Okay. What a young, good-looking guy back then, and uh, very active, and all the young people liked him. And then, uh, in 1965, South Aberdeen, uh, became officially established, uh, and uh, I still remember that feeling of uh, excitement uh, over the manual when we heard that our daughter church uh, was growing and doing well. And I think, uh, you know, it must have been somewhat uh, like the joy that Jesus felt. Uh, remember when he sent those 72 out and they came back to him and they said, uh, basically, Lord, your plan is working. And uh, this is one of the only times, I think, in the New Testament when we think about the life of Jesus, that Jesus was filled with joy. Usually we think of him as a person, you know, that uh, Jesus, man of sorrows, but uh, when he found out that his kingdom was being built, the plan is working, uh, Jesus was overjoyed. And uh, so, uh, would you join me in prayer right now? Uh, Father, uh, I thank you for the wonderful memories of this church. Uh, I thank you for their devotion, for their love, their loyalty, their enthusiasm for Jesus. And thank you that uh, the ultimate goal of this flock 
is to be both individually and congregationally, wholeheartedly devoted to you. Father, I pray that to achieve this goal, the Holy Spirit will empower each person and may their continued proclamation of your word. Honor in Christ, uh, both in this worship sanctuary and in their daily lives, as they serve and as they encourage one another, may be a beacon uh, the world may know Jesus. And as we conclude today, thank you, Father, for the love that binds us, for the food that nourishes us and those that prepare it, and for the fellowship and for the giving of your Son to our world. Saves us in his name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand and join us as we sing Lead Me Lord? <laughs>
and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. And I believe you're dismissed to the fellowship hall for lunch. <laughs>